welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie. How are you, Jamie? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. Is the family all doing well? Yeah, everybody seems to be doing pretty well. Um, we're getting some work done. My husband is home today working on getting speakers put in downstairs that he had wanted to mm -hmm. put in the, the living room. So mm -hmm. disclaimer, if you hear some banging, it just happens oh. to be right under this room. And it's not like a noise bang where I can close the door. It's like right. a vibrate through the walls bang. So if you hear that, you know, it, you probably won't. But if you do, it's that's that's it's not Tommy knockers. It's my husband. And it's definitely not Matt stuck in the basement because Jamie's trapped him in there trying to get the attention of some good Samaritan on the other end of our podcast. It's not that at all. No, not at all. He doesn't need to be rescued. For sure. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> wink, wink. Well, I'm excited that we get to continue on with our discussion of Proverbs 31. If you've missed earlier shows, we've basically been going verse by verse with the intention of looking at Proverbs 31 through the lens of how does the Proverbs 31 woman pray? And... I know we touched on it just a tiny, tiny bit in the last episode, but I would love to spend more time starting on verse 16. Uh, so maybe I will go ahead and read the verses that we're planning to discuss. So maybe you can open us up in prayer after that. Sounds like a plan. All right. So we're in Proverbs 31, 16 and 17 in the NIV. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. All right. Well, that yeah, we've been getting through like two to three verses in a in a sitting. So I think that's a good good chunk to bite off right off the bat. So it yeah. really is, yeah. And I love that we get to talk today about Proverbs 31 woman as a businesswoman, mm -hmm. as having a sphere of influence that extends outside the immediate family. I love that we get to dive into what that means for us today as praying Christian women in the 21st century. Which is a great segue into prayer. Let's pray. Let's do it. God, we just thank you for this passage again. Thank you for the Proverbs 31 woman. Thank you um, just for giving us a picture of who you see us to be, how you celebrate us. I picture you singing, rejoicing over us with singing, singing this passage after looking back at um, at, at last week's conversation about this. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to glean what you would have us get out of this passage. I pray that you would um, silence any lies, any condemnation, any negative connotations that this passage might stir up in us. Help us to look at it as um, a celebration of womanhood in all aspects. Help us to see ourselves reflected in this passage this week, even if we don't work outside the home or inside the home and, and um, just whatever work we do, help us to see ourselves reflected in this passage. Also help bring to mind ways that we can pursue um, the things that you have for us, God. Help us to recognize areas that we have false responsibilities that we've put on ourselves or that others have put on ourselves on us. Um, and help us to kind of tease through that so that we can um, hear your voice clearly and just see clearly the woman you are calling us into, who, who we are now, how you love us just as we are, what are the good things that we're doing now, and who you're calling us into as we just continue that process of refinement that you, you promised through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I was thinking of a just for fun we could do. Um, and I, I hope this one won't put you too much on the spot since we didn't chat about it before. But in verse 17, when it talks about she sets about her work vigorously, her arms are strong for her task. Like we can picture like Rosie the Riveter, right? The um the World War II poster, like yeah. the very like strong, we can do this type woman. Who is somebody that you know? Who would if you had to name the hardest working woman that you know? Oh, wow. Oh, man. Well, honestly, you come to mind. <laughs> I'm not that's, like, that's not there. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. You are like one of the hardest workers I know. Um, okay, let me think. Okay, I'll tell you one of mine while you're tell thinking. Tell you one of mine. Tell you one of mine. 
<laughs> okay, tell I'll tell you know. yours. So it's this it's this lady in Alaska named Delana. No, actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually not. I I try to work in a lot of just rest and downtime. Um, yesterday, my my biggest goal yesterday was to figure out some finance stuff and some ad spend stuff and some marketing stuff. And I honestly took like two hours to do a puzzle. And in my mind, it was like this, like my brain needs this, <laughs> like putting pieces together time. So so my work is not. Um, I wouldn't call it. It's at the very least, it's not physically vigorous, but the hardest working woman, at least one of the ones I know. So let's not necessarily say hardest, but an example of a very, very, very hardworking woman. There is a lady, she has since moved out of our community. But when we first moved here, when our oldest was a baby, she worked at the daycare where I worked at. And then when we came back, um, we moved back to the area several years ago and she was a school janitor and she kept really uh, like a school janitor position. Like it's, it goes pretty late at night. Like, I don't know exactly what her hours were, but I know it extended beyond, you know, like eight or nine at night, you know, like a sports game would get out at nine 30 and she'd still have hours of work ahead of her, you know, and she had a very large family. So sometimes she'd have like young kids just hanging out at the school with her while she was doing the cleaning. Um, just amazing. Um, yeah, hardworking woman and had been that way her entire, entire life. And um, yeah, I just really admired the way she took care of the school. She took care of her family um, and did a lot of extra stuff too, like especially with, um, you know, some of the sports and things like that. We're such a small community that there really isn't enough volunteer manpower just from like boosters and pairs I don't even I don't think we have like a booster club you know it's basically just hey we need somebody to make tacos for this basketball team and you know and she was always there so yeah well one someone that came to mind I, there are there are lots of people that come to mind as hardworking women um but the one that like when I look lifetime not just recently mm -hmm. um our pastor's wife in Arizona we actually had her on the podcast one time. Her name's Christy Olaf. And she was like, not just hardworking at work. So she, mm -hmm. but it was like every, every facet, like you're saying, it's like, it's like every facet of life. It's not just a hard worker at work. So she, when I knew her, I still know her, but when I right, right, right. lived there, she was not working outside the home other than being a pastor's wife and the leader of our worship team and mm -hmm. she um and, and she did both of those things very well took them very seriously like you said with your example mm -hmm. like just always always doing something for the church always um hosting us in her home but she also in addition to that had i'm, I'm hoping i'm kind of she had four biological boys and then two two to four foster kids at any given mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. at this point her boys are grown she has two adopted kids and um they're younger but she is working outside the home also in addition to being pastor's wife um yeah. and doing all the things for the church and she always and she always has a home that is welcoming to people and it's, it always seems to be immaculate. So this is one of those people that you just look at and you're like, <laughs> how does she do, do it? Do you sleep? But, and she's right? always like investing in individuals as well. Like she always mm -hmm. has people that whether it's musically or like with organizations, she'll come, like she did this yeah. for me. She'll come into people's homes and kind of help them weekly get organized but she's mm -hmm. always discipling like the word discipleship comes to mind mm. so she's got kids family ministry work outside the home now in real estate and discipleship and and she just is never idle like i see this you yeah. know in this passage like i think the word idle doesn't it say that she's never idle or she goes about her work vigorously mm -hmm. like that's yeah, I picture that she's she's like every woman, you know, the Whitney Houston song. I'm every woman. I don't know that one, but I do like Whitney Houston. So I, I'd probably recognize it if I heard that's going to be going through my head. I'm every woman. It's all <laughs> OK, sorry. Never mind. I love I'm it. I'm <laughs> not going to do my rendition, but it love that song. It's going to be going through my head all the time. 
today. Oh, but perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. She sets about her work vigorously. The verse where it says her arms are strong for her tasks. I always picture, I'm going to describe it to you. And you tell me if you remember this from like homes in your childhood. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid and it was like, you go to an older person's house and it felt like <laughs> they had two things. <laughs> they had the footprints poem on a plaque somewhere mm -hmm. in their home. Right. Okay, Do you remember yep. that? And with the Sandy and then, Beach picture. Yes. And then the other picture I remember being in so many Christian homes, it was um, just a man and a woman and it was two like side by side pictures and it was their folded hands like they were praying over their meal. Does that ring a bell to you? Mm -mm. Okay. Maybe it was just in my babysitter's home and I'm extrapolating it to be like 90% of people in this generation had this. No, but the first always... one for sure. For sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but when it says her arms are strong for her task, it actually always reminds me of that, that picture, this picture that prayer is a vigorous work. Like mm -hmm. nobody has prayed for your child like you have. And I'm going to throw that out as a blanket to just about every mother who is listening um, and to everybody who was born of a Christian woman. Nobody with maybe like a very small percentage of exceptions has prayed for you with the power and the vigor that your mom has. And so that's that's the picture that always comes to mind. So I'm excited to dive in more. Um, we have a couple quick announcement breaks. So let's go jump into those. Um, we wanted to let you know, we've got kind of two Instagram accounts now. So we are revising the Praying Christian Women Instagram account. So if you haven't followed us, you can follow us at Praying Christian Women. And then Praying Christian Women is now one of the shows under the Christian Books Today umbrella. So you could also follow Christian Books Today to get um, even more. So the Praying Christian Women account will obviously be specific about prayer for women in this podcast when we have new episodes. And then Christian Books Today also includes things like new books, um, if you like Christian fiction, other podcasts in the network, and all kinds of stuff like that. All righty. Well, I am excited to dive in. So I'll read it one more time and then we can just kind of dissect the things that we want to chat about. So Proverbs 31, 16 and 17. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. Where do you want to start with this? Um. So I think like considering a field and buying it and out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard um, just to address the whole idea of out of her earnings. This is implying that she's earning stuff and we it talks about different ways that she does make a living. Um, mm -hmm. But for the woman listening who works totally at home, because I know we're going to be talking a lot about working outside the home because I think Personally, it feels like the stereotypical Proverbs 31 woman is a homemaker, right? And doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily work outside the home. But I just want to talk about like, there is, there are lots of ways that you can contribute financially to your family as a woman that you don't have to be working to do. And I know that I struggled with this after um, I was working like, a couple of part-time jobs in Arizona. And when we moved to Alaska, I wasn't earning any money outside the home. And it made me, I, I developed a little bit of a complex, not only in like not having as much ministry that I was doing, but also mm -hmm. not earning money in the home. And I sort of felt like I wasn't contributing at all. Contributing, and, yeah. And I just feel like if you are in that position, some women are like owning, working from home or, you know, working in the home, meaning not financially bringing in money. Um, but some are not. And for you that is listening, that, that is feeling like less than for not earning, there are so many ways. Like I, I tell myself when I, and write it, you know, I, I just would tell myself ways that I can contribute involve uh being a good shopper you know you can yeah. flip coupons you can look for deals you can take time to plan meals and not shop as often to save money that way 
you can, yeah. you know, you are by, by default, if you have children in the home, you're saving money for daycare, which is exorbitantly right. expensive. Um, so you are contributing that way. Um, you're preventing your, you know, you're, you're cleaning your home. You can keep your home um, in a way that you don't need to get a housekeeper, you know, just things like that. And you can, yeah. not that you even have to justify, but I'm just saying from experience for someone who's either worked and then finds themselves in a place of not bringing in any money financially for their family. Um, you know, these are some ways that, that you can, I guess, not e either focus on and say, this is, these are ways that I am already helping, or you can say, I can do my part even more to provide for my family by couponing or looking for good deals mm. or cooking more instead of eating out more, just whatever it is. I just feel like there, there are ways other than working outside the home or working from home and generating income that you can provide for yeah. your family financially. Yeah, it definitely gets loaded. And I think no matter what situation you find yourself in, you're going to experience potential pain points. So let's say you are a single adult woman and you're supporting yourself. There is in the dating world, there is a little bit of fear, even from very like from women who would consider themselves very independent. There is a fear of, well, if I'm earning too much money, it's going to be intimidating to to a man, right? Um, so there's a pain point there. There's a pain point like you were talking about. If you go from I'm working and I feel like I'm contributing to the family to now I'm not, and our society is so caught up in what is the monetary value of what you do. Like I remember it was it was a good long time ago. It was maybe like 10 years ago that they slapped a number on here's what the typical stay-at-home mom is worth if you had to hire out all of her jobs. And on the one hand, it's empowering because it's like, wow, I do a lot. But on the other hand, it's like, why does everything needs to be transactional like that? Right. <laughs> you know, like, do I really need to justify my existence and my my work? Yeah, no. And, and I, a dollar it amount, a like it's kind of gross if so, you think about it in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, and if you find yourself focusing on that too much, definitely check mm -hmm. yourself. I know I've had to. What are your motives? Yeah. Why are you feeling this way? Are you projecting? Yes. Are you getting it from somewhere else? And mm -hmm. how do you how do you find you know comfort in just being being comfortable in your role, whatever that is at whatever, whatever season of life is. you find yourself in. But you're exactly. so right. Like there are pain points all around with with reading and we've talked about it with Proverbs 31, whether you're a single woman or you're a married woman with no children, or you're a married mm -hmm. woman that works in the home or works out of the home. I mean, they're just all yeah. these different angles that I think are insecurities through this passage can sometimes yeah. get triggered. And, and I think that's a good sure. thing. I think that's a good thing because it's telling. So if you find yourself disturbed or feeling less than, just ex take those feelings to God and unpack them. Take them to a yeah. friend or a trusted mentor or even a counselor and kind of unpack like, why am I feeling this way? Because scripture is meant to uplift us, to challenge us, but never to, um, you know, defeat us or make us feel exactly. despair or guilt or shame. Yeah. Or to hold us down. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I do feel like there are segments in Christian culture that use Proverbs 31 to teach that a woman who works outside of the home is sinful or, you know, or things like that. And so, yeah, the, the powers that be, you know, you look through the, the sordid history of the Catholic church over, you know, basically the last 2000 years or I don't know, 1700 years, however long <laughs> it's been, that there's been kind of an organized global church that also wields political power. They take, and not necessarily the individuals and, and not necessarily every single individual, but as an entity, they take certain passages of scripture and use it to keep the masses in line, right? And so I think about um, the fear that so many Christian women have about earning money. And this can apply whether you're single 
and and never want to get married and then you're worried that the people in the church are looking at you like you know who's this uppity feminist who feels like she don't need a man <laughs> this can apply if you're single but want to be married but you're worried that like i said it it feels like certain men are going to be intimidated if you're you know kind of kicking butt in in the in the working world um and then i remember when i got married we didn't want to wait too long to have kids and the advice that was very prevalent at the time was if you get a job, don't ever become dependent on the finances for that job because that then if you get pregnant and want to stay home, you want to be able to not be dependent on that income. So on the one hand, that's really, really, really good advice. And it worked fine for us because we didn't have any issues getting pregnant. And I went basically from being a stay-at-home wife with a very, very part-time job to a stay-at-home mom with no outside job. So that transition worked fine for us. However, there are certain scenarios where that mindset can be really, really troubling and problematic because if you want to be very cynical, the undertone is a little bit of woman don't get too big, right? Don't don't reach your full learning potential um, and, and stuff like that. And I think it's really important to acknowledge um, the financial abuse that can happen in relationships. Mm-hmm. And so I don't have a checklist in front of me, but if you are married, or I could even see this being um, for young women who live at home, and are de- are dependent on a parent. Um, if you don't have access to finances or a way to earn finances, then that is, um, I mean, that is what is called today financial abuse. So it would be like if um, I'm going to throw out just a goofy hypothetical so that we can keep it like kind of light. I say, um, oh, Jamie, why don't you come to Alaska and bring the kids and come visit us? And then I like steal your ID (laughs) so that you can't fly back. And I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. And you're like, well, I, you know, I want to, I want to go get a job so that I can, you know, help support. And I'm like, no, we'll take care of you. And then like, Oh, by the way, I need your kids to do all these chores for me. And oh, you know what? Since you're here, why don't you do, you know, like all the housework and all of this. And you keep saying, I'm I'm really kind of interested in, you know, working outside of the home. And I say, oh, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Like, I love taking care of you. And on, on one side, it sounds sweet and romantic and like loving and selfless. But on the other hand, some people do use that. Because my undercurrent might not be, I want to take care of Jamie and make her feel pampered. It might be, there's no way that I want Jamie to learn that she can exist without me. Um, and yeah. it's it's hard. And I, I wish we had like an expert, like, what do you do if you find yourself in that situation? Yeah. Are you asking me or you're saying you- I kind of am. Me? Like this yeah. is where you and I stare at each other with doe eyes. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. I need that shrug emoji. <laughs> that will be our one soundboard for the show. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I actually, I have known people in this situation and it is, it's really complicated. And the advice that they were given when they went to see a, um, like a counselor or pastor was, Number one, have a mediated conversation with a third party um, if that person isn't responsive to your desire to be involved in the finances, because this person had no access to anything and bills were going unpaid and yeah. notices were being given and this per- the other person wasn't taking care of things, yet she didn't have access to what she needed. So, um, you know, the advice given is get a third party involved if you're not being given the access that you need. And when that third party was involved, this this guy opened it up and, you know, kind of reluctantly, but allowed her to assess the situation on her own and take over Mm -hmm. so that she, not all of it, but, you know, to have access so that things could get paid and, you know, but it is tough because there is, there's a lot of gray area in, yeah. You know, I mean, some people try to make 
couples feel bad when they have separate bank accounts like oh but you're mm-hmm. one flesh you have to have one bank account well there are lots of reasons why some choose both of them independently mutually choose just like they're different ways of people working outside the home and inside the home whether you're exactly. male or female so not that there needs to be a cookie cutter oh everyone always has to have access you um you know to everything I- i'm not saying mm-hmm. that because i'm not going to say that that you guys can't come to you guys meaning a couple can't come to right. your own agreement of what works but both people have to be happy with it and on board and mm-hmm. thriving and it needs to be working for everyone and when yeah. i think the litmus test for am i in a situation like this would be do you feel powerless in this area do you feel like you desire more input or you desire something whether it's whether you desire to work outside the home or you desire to have a little bit more access to see what's going on with the finances on the day to day Mm -hmm. week to week month to month and you're not being given that and it's being withheld because we should never in a marriage we shouldn't withhold something that the other person i'm not going to make that blanket statement but in general we need to both be on the same page so I would just say, if that conversation, because the other thing is, have you asked? Because I could see a husband and wife where let's, let's go the other side. The wife is the one that's the mm-hmm. breadwinner and has the bank account and is like, okay, you know, you stay home and do whatever you don't need. I'm, I'm, I got this. And mm-hmm. maybe she's a type A and he's more of a go along with the flow, but really doesn't like it but maybe hasn't told her that maybe, you know, right. a, I think a, a conversation one-on-one can go a long way. Cause I can't tell you how many times I have brought something up to my husband that I thought was a given, like, of course right. I wasn't happy with this. And yeah. he looks at me like I'm an alien from another planet. Like, yes. Like, what do you mean? You didn't like that. I thought that was great. So uh-huh. yeah, that was a lot all at once. I would say, if you're having a problem with any of these things, definitely try to talk to your spouse or or the person that you're talking to um, mm-hmm. one-on-one first. But if that doesn't work, bring in a third party, pastor, counselor, trusted friend, family member. I don't know, family member's kind of loaded because it could be you know one-sided and feel like an it ambush. Neutral third yeah. party, let's say that. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it can be so hard and even in a the course of a marriage it likely will morph and change you know like we've run the entire gamut we've run the gamut of like i am completely dependent on scott and like at when we were really um young parents we just had a debit card and and i would do the shopping but i would need to call him and be like how much can i put on the debit card because like there was that fear while they're checking out like i don't want to overdraft and i don't know what's in the account and you know um so we went you know we we've had that side of it we've had the side where like um now i i handle paying the bills and stuff and scott doesn't really want to know because it's a um it's a little like I don't need to know. So just as long as I know that, you know, the, the heating oil is going to get filled this month, like mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good enough for me. Yeah. Um, and, and so it can morph and change over a relationship. And I think, yeah, like you said, there's no right way for a couple to work out their finances. I think it just goes back to whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, whatever you do, may it be done in love. Right. So, um, I'll just throw out a couple hypotheticals. Like I used to be really um, aggressively nitpicky about the charges on our accounts. And some of that's because I'm type A and kind of a control freak. Some of that's because I was raised in a really frugal household. And some of that's because early on, like it was either this like, $5 $5 DVD rental or the, the carton of eggs so that we can have breakfast, you know? And, but it got to where like Scott would feel like, you know, like our joke is I came home. It was our very first um, December married. We'd been married for about six months. 
Mm-hmm. I came home. I walked into our little office. I logged on to all the finances because I would check up on them, you know, every few days. And I saw that Scott had made a $60 charge to something. And I was so frustrated and so upset. I'm like, what in the world did he spend $60 on? And I looked at who the charge was from. It was from like a flower company. Mm. And then I walked out into the dining room and he had bought me this like really cute, like, Christmas flower arrangement as a surprise. (laughs) But my first thought was, what in the world is my husband doing, you know, spending money that we don't have? Um, And so hypothetically, it could make sense. Like if you are stressing over every single purchase that your significant other or your spouse is making, maybe it does make sense to just have, you know, like, okay, here's, here's what we need for, um, the the family to survive <laughs> here's what i earn here's what you earn let's both put some of our earnings into a pot and then you know here's kind of what the re- you know the other person's responsible for so the way we do it is kind of we share um everything that is needed for like you know mortgage and that kind of stuff like that all comes out of one bank account that we both put money in and then I take care kind of from my my bank account that's in my name. I take care of this bill, that bill, and that bill. And, you know, so I'm kind of up on, I'm the one who gets to do the fun job of like saving to make sure that if the washer breaks, we have money in the bank to get a new washer. Scott gets the job of being like, you know what? I feel like going out to dinner. Let's go out to dinner, <laughs> you know? And it, it kind of fits both of our personalities. I and was so going to say that it works totally well. fits your personalities. I and know. It works. It? And right. Because that's, I mean, I could totally see him getting a lot of joy being like, yes. I get to do this for you and let's yeah. do this. Yeah. Yeah. Very- and then I get to totally turn off my, this is, you know, this is not a responsible use of money. You know, I get to be like, right? cool, this is fun. And I'm glad I don't have to worry about like, is there money in the bank for this? Does this fit the budget? Cause that's, you know, he, he handles that side of it. So, but again, I, I do want to go back to how easy it is for people and women specifically to be controlled financially in ways that we probably don't even know that we're not aware of. Um, and I think that if nothing else, like, let's say that you were, you were doing amazingly, you've got plenty of money, you've got very few financial concerns. And if you're married, you feel like you and your husband are like perfectly aligned. Like, let's say none of the pain points here apply to you. What I would say to you is, um, open your eyes, do a tiny bit to open your eyes to some of the financial exploitation that goes on in the world, whether that's in a domestic partnership or whether that's, you know, like, um, you know, work factories or, or things like that. And let that become a prayer burden, or at least do enough research and investigating to see if that's a a prayer burden that God's laying on your heart. Cause, cause it's really, really sad, you know, like the, um, the very, brief explanation and the dumbed down version of kind of the financial exploitation of an employee would be like, um, I know even there are certain Alaska canneries that have been, um, I don't know if they get fined or shut down, but I know they've gotten in trouble with different regulatory um, overseeing agencies because the idea is, hey, come work in this fish cannery. We'll provide you room and board. Um But then you get there and a lot of people are coming from places where that's not their home, right? They're coming from outside of Alaska and sometimes outside of the U.S. And so once you're there, then, um, okay, you got to work, you know, in these really awful, deplorable conditions. Oh, and by the way, now you owe us money because we're providing, you know, your rent. And, you know, so in in an extreme over abuse of financial power, you could be stuck there forever. You know, it's, it's, um, that I sold my soul to the company store, you know, like it's like that. Um, and, and even, even worse and in other parts of the planet. And like I said, even in the U S um, that, that absolutely is happening. And it's something to definitely be praying against. Yeah. And keeping on the the prayer theme, if you find, I, I think there are two prayer takeaways from the whole idea of finances in a marriage and, or in a family or whatever. 
is number one, like just be praying and examining yourself. Am I exhibiting any of these controlling behaviors? Am yeah. I trying to micromanage the finances? Like, cause I, I can definitely resonate with some of the micromanaging mindset mm -hmm. because I've struggled with that before too. Yeah. Am I micromanaging? Am I co am I, am I living a partnership in, in finances and in the financial oversight with my spouse or with a family member, parent, whatever, however it works out. Um, am I doing that in a way that's loving? And, and I think that's one side of it, but on the other side, there's, am I a victim of financial abuse? Mm -hmm. And yeah, are there parts of my financial oversight that make me uncomfortable or make me feel trapped or powerless yeah. or mm -hmm. discouraged? And if so, I would say start with prayer before any conversation happens um, and just, you know, kind of journal and pray through your emotions, kind of like we talked about with, are there any triggers in Proverbs 31? Mm -hmm. What are your triggers? Why do you think, ask yeah. God why these are happening? Maybe even to the point of going to see a counselor or talking to someone independently before you ever approach someone one-on-one -on -one to talk about it, just to work through your feelings yeah. and, and kind of get a sounding board. And then pray for the conversation if or when it happens. Um, and just, you know, be amazed at, at the ways that God provides the exact right opportunity and timing for that conversation or provides the right person to give you a perspective or mm -hmm. maybe even prompts them to have a conversation with you before yeah. you even have to talk about it. Yeah. Or brings up the right time for it to come up. Cause I think as women, and especially if you yes. consider, you know, I might be in a, in a power, um, an abuse of power situation. It is important to bring things up at the right time, right? We yes. don't want anybody to listen to this and feel shame and be like, oh, I, I identify myself in this situation. I better go get myself out of it today, right? There's uh, women know how to read, <laughs> read the room. Um, and we have developed that. And I think God has given us that gift for our safety, which is sad that we need it. But since we do, let's go ahead and um, and use it. And then I want to add one more. There was one more thing that came to mind when you were talking um, and it completely left me and I'm so bummed because I think it was pretty important. Okay. Let's just so you, real quick recap. We got to rewind. To pastor, talk to a pastor or counselor to work It was out the different scenarios. Thing. The two. So you started with two scenarios and I wanted to give a third scenario. So the scenario oh, okay. of maybe you're over controlling right? Um, mm -hmm. The scenario of maybe you're in an abusive situation. I remember now. Thank you. <laughs> and then I want to, um, I want to add one more scenario um, that again, let's say we're going to add the scenario so that maybe if you fall in this category, you can identify yourself and find some encouragement. Um, maybe you can just go into life with your eyes a little wider open Um like there's a lot of scams out there that target like especially widows and things like that. So we need to be aware of that. Um, and then lastly, again, if none of this applies to you personally, you can make it a prayer burden. And that is for, um, you know, a woman, if you are married to an addict, right? Like I read, I think it was a Lynn Austin historical novel about the temperance movement, which I never really studied or thought about. And it was this whole town where like the day the husbands got their paychecks, they just took it straight to the bar, signed it over to the bar. And then these like moms with kids have no, no food for their families. And, um, and there was a scene where the woman even like went to the boss and was like, can, can you give me the check instead? And, yeah. and legally like he couldn't. And you know, so there's um, there's situations like that, or um, addictions to gambling, or or things. My um, my grandma that we talk about so much on the podcast, her husband. I don't I don't know the whole scenario, but I know part of his mental illness would be these periods of mania where he would go and like um, try to buy an airplane, you know, or like just very like grandiose, mm -hmm. huge things like that, and so. And, and grandma and I never talked about that side of her life. So I just kind of know it like third hand, but 
I'm picturing, okay, here's a woman who um, is, is committed to her marriage and, and loves her husband, but also knows that she cannot allow him to sign this dotted line to buy an airplane. Do you know what I mean? And that's a, that's a very hard situation too. And in that case, I think if anybody listening finds himself in that scenario, my prayer for you is that you just find the courage and discernment and tact and backbone of Abigail. Um, she's the one who was married to <laughs> the fool was his nickname. Um, and he refused to help David and his men and really insulted them. And so David and his men were just going to go and kill their whole um, their whole household and all the servants. And Abigail was the one who she did go behind her husband's back, which is very troubling to a lot of Christian women. And it's troubling to me, but I think the, the circumstances, I, I'm not going to sit here on my high horse and say that she did the wrong thing. She went behind her husband's back to make peace with David and ended up saving her, you know, entire household. Um, so again, I just want to recognize that some women do find themselves in that, that trapped ugly, like <laughs> there's no way to be a hundred percent submissive to a husband who wants to buy an airplane that he cannot fly and you cannot afford. Right. And yeah. so at that point, um, again, I don't have specific tips of advice advice for you other than like we see you we are praying for you and my prayer for you is to have that discernment of abigail and to know when is it time to go and fix your husband's mess in order to save your your household um and that's that's hard i mean even saying those words i get a little bit nervous because that's it goes so against what we think of as as godly submission and so yeah but again, yeah. discernment, Holy Spirit involvement in every decision, seeking godly counsel before making any big decisions like that, but realizing that there is a time and a season for being the mama bear that protects your family. Yes. And yep. standing yeah. up for anything that sets itself up against God's standards for your family too. So it's it's a for fine sure line and it's not a line we can tell you where it is even you need exactly to do some self-examination again seek godly counsel and counseling if you need it mm -hmm. before moving forward but make sure you don't just render yourself powerless under this mm -hmm. umbrella of oh i've got to be submissive yes yes because that has been used um the the most extreme case i know of it's a book called um black and white Bible, black and blue wife. I think I've probably mentioned it before. Yes, and it's about this woman who was being abused by her husband, but thought that in the name of submission, she had to just accept it. And what became even worse was he was abusing um, the foster children they were taking care of. And she was made aware of it and um, did not feel the the safety or the freedom to to alert the police it, it turned into oh now i'm complicit in what my husband's doing and i need to cover up for him which does happen when you have um abusive relationships or addicts you know like we get tied into covering and empowering and all of that and it can get so messy and i feel really bad i went into today thinking like yay we get to talk about women who can earn money and support families and instead so we're talking about like all these terrible horrible <laughs> scenarios yeah, it's interesting to me always like the the tangent, not even tangents that we go off That's on. the I, direction it the goes. The direction, yeah. but I feel like it's Holy Spirit led. We always ask God, please guide and direct our conversation. So I'm convinced someone needs this, if not a ton of yeah. someone's. Um, yeah. And, and I just feel like sometimes you'll see, oh, they're talking about Proverbs 31. I know all about that, but there's so much to glean there's always something new to find in it. Mm -hmm. So I love that mm -hmm. about our conversations yeah. is there's just yeah. always something new. Yeah. And taking it back to the heart of what I thought we would be talking about. Um, I think it's important to do just a heart check, make sure that whatever, like in your church, whatever church you go to, I'm going to guess that there are um, women who fall on every side of the financial spectrum from being a hundred percent reliant on their husbands. And that's the perfect situation for them 
to being, I never want to get married and I want to be like a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Um, and if you go to a big enough church, you're going to have everybody in between there. And I think, again, we need to go back to whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. If you're staying home, clipping coupons and, and taking care of your babies, do it for the glory of God, but don't look down on the woman who's not, if you're struggling and, um, like even if our kids were 10 years younger than they are, like I feel so blessed that I was able to be home. And I think that that's even harder. And like, I talk about, yeah, like I would go to Walmart and not know how much money was on the debit card and basically have to tell the checker when to stop <laughs> checking groceries. And yeah, that was hard, but I think it's even harder for a lot of couples today. So do not let anybody whose financial situation is, um, pattier than yours make you feel bad if you've got to go out and work even if you would prefer to stay home um i think the amazing thing about women and we talked about this a little on our previous episode like celebrating womanhood through proverbs 31 like a hallmark of a woman to be celebrated is someone who will do whatever needs to get done for her family and so maybe that means you go out and do that like 4 a.m. shift that's really, really, really soul breaking and back breaking. Um, and, and it kills you to not be with your kids. Um, you're doing that for the glory of God and you're doing that for your family and you are amazing. And I think that this verse exemplifies you. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. I love it. All right. Well, amen. Amen. And amen, and we will talk to you all next time.